excuse me, I'm sorry about that. I got a, a tickle. You ever get one of those that's just kind of, you can't hardly get rid of it? I didn't hear any amens, but I, on my inside, I heard it. <laughs> You've been there. Uh, does anybody else have a tough time with winter darkness? Uh, I know at our house, Dawn gets after me. Sorry, I'm going to use you for an illustration here. But Dawn gets after me because because the, the lights are off. That I I'm sitting somewhat in in the in the dark, and uh, she goes around and flips all them things back on, and she just likes that that light. And it's not that I like darkness. Just sometimes when I'm praying and and so forth, it's just easier not to get distracted, I guess, maybe, uh, type of thing. But we know that, that there are parts of the country where the winter nights are a whole lot longer than they are here. And uh, there are people, and I know a number of them, that struggle in the winter time with darkness. And apparently, there is a name for this condition. Something that happens to, to people when there is a lack of light. Um, and it impacts their, their mental state. In other words, it impacts their moods that they, they have. And this uh, mental health condition is called season... Whoops, turn it on. Seasonal... Affective disorder. You heard of that? What? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> it is nicknamed SAD, S A D. <laughs> Did you read my notes? <laughs> it affects about 6% of U.S. citizens. Now, 6%. You know, it doesn't sound, okay, that's just six, but that's almost 20 million people that it affects every year. Sad diagnoses are most common then in the late fall, early winter, times of the year when the sunlight is, is at a, a minimal, where there's more darkness than there is sunlight. Common symptoms of sad include uh, agitation, changes in appetite or weight, uh, difficulty concentrating, concentrating, feelings of hopelessness and guilt, insomnia, low energy, uh, loss of interest in activities, and even thoughts of death and suicide. WebMD says that a change in sunlight pattern messes with the body's internal clock, reducing serotonin levels. Now, serotonin is a, serotonin is a chemical that our body produces that, that helps our, uh, our nerves and our brain connect, have good communication. You've, I, I know all of you have experienced that being on the phone and talking to somebody that's at a distance and doesn't have good reception and you, you catch about every third word. Um, serotonin helps the nerves and the brain to make that clear connection that is there. So it's important to us. And when that serotonin level is low, then you run into that static uh, within your body. And, and what we call that then is the winter blues. There's, uh, we, we get them. So... This change in sunlight interferes also with our, our body's melatonin production. Then we have another chemical that our body produces, and that Im impacts our moods that we have, but it also impacts our sleep patterns that uh, we, we experience. 
And of course, we've all heard about the exposure to sunlight helps our bodies produce vitamin D, uh, which supports our immune system. Uh, and I was kind of surprised at, at some of these as I was doing my study when it came out that uh, it reduces the risk of uh, multiple sclerosis, decreases the chance for heart disease, reduces the likelihood of severe illnesses, vitamin D helps regulate mood, and reduce depression. And they even say it helps support weight loss. Bottom line, we just don't function well without sunlight. A customer service agent in a utility company in Rochester, New York, wrote about, a working, about working near one of those horrible storms that they have out there. I don't know if you've heard of the lake effect snows that they have out in that area. We, I know more about them because of living there, but all of them winter storms come across every single one of those great lakes, and when they hit land, they dump all that moisture, all that snow. So there's violent storms that happen there. They call it lake effect snowstorms. But one of these was going on, and, and the power was knocked out. Utility crews would we're putting in 16 hours days to get the damage repaired. But one of these, and I would guess somewhat clueless, customers, they called to complain about the power outage. And they asked, how will I know when my lights come back on? <laughs> well, like you, the customer service agent was stumped for a little while. I mean... How would you answer that question nicely? Finally, the customer service agent just simply said, um, they'll be brighter than they are now? Well, at that, the customer hung up. But I think that's a pretty good answer right there. When you're in the dark, when the lights come on, you will know it you will notice a difference. You know, even a tiny sliver of light is noticeable in darkness. It makes a noticeable difference. Did you know that they say that the human eye can see a candlelight from 1.6 miles away? if the conditions are, are right. Now, there was one place that I, I, in my research I was looking at, they stretched that out to 30 miles. Now, I don't know about that. But, even at one and a half miles, I mean, that's pretty mind-boggling, isn't it? That light, that little bitty bit light, can be that so significant that you can see it from that distance in the dark. So I don't know about the 30 mile thing. It just kind of sounds like a, a stretch to me. But for a candlelight. But this much I do know that a birthday cake with 70 candles on it is bright. And it is warm when you're trying to blow the candles out. It took Slay, or uh, Jagger is off to this side of that picture. It took four of us to blow out all the candles. It's what happens when you get old, I guess. Now, I don't have to tell you that light is pretty important to us. Just maybe remind you how important it is. Even life giving to us. And it makes, when we bring that out, it makes what Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 even more impactful to us and to the world that is around us. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 5 here. Very, again, very familiar scripture that uh, Jesus tells us. 
We're going to be looking at 4 through 16 right now. You were the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Now, to really understand what Jesus is teaching here, we need to understand what came before this part of the scripture. Jesus has just finished teaching his followers of what uh, God's kingdom is like. And he's talking about in God's kingdom the poor in spirit, the mourners, the meek, the pure in heart, the peacemakers are all close to God. And as we're going through that part of that but that comes before this, we get to verses 10 through 12. And I want to bring these verses out. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For there's a kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus speaking here. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, this doesn't sound much like a blessed state. And it makes it, e- or it, does, it, makes it even harder when we comprehend this, this Greek word blessed. It's a, the word uh, makaros in Greek. And it is also translated as happy. What? Happy? How can someone be happy when they're being insulted, when they're being persecuted, and when they're being lied about? That doesn't make sense. What what would we call that nowadays? Wouldn't we call that abuse? It would leave scars, wouldn't we? But Jesus tells us that we are blessed even happy in these situations. And if this wasn't hard enough to understand, Jesus kicks it up a notch. He says, then rejoice. Actually, the Greek word there for rejoice actually means jump for joy. When's the last time you jumped for joy? Was it because you were being insulted or talked about? (laughs) I'm sure there are plenty of things that might get us to jump for joy. Now, for some of us, it might not be physically jumping very high, but on our inside, the cow is jumping over the moon. We know what that is. But persecution? Being lied about? Stories told on you? That doesn't make us normally jump for joy. So why? Why would Jesus tell us to do something so strange? So seemingly, what's the word counterintuitive? Doesn't make sense? Humanly. Naturally, I think we can maybe find an answer to our, in this Bible passage that we're looking at this morning, and also in the verse 13 that is just prior to our scripture for the day, where the Bible tells us that you are the salt of the earth. 
What is salt of the earth? Why would he use that? Well, in those days, and, and still is, it's used as a preservative for food. Then it also is used for, to help cure disease, for health issues, uh, and so forth. And of course, salt has always been used to, to add, bring out flavor or to add flavor to, to food. It brings bland food to life, puts a zing in what crosses your tongue. You ever been on a salt-free diet? Yeah, pretty miserable. Maybe even persecuting. <laughs> I think it should be put in a category of a weight loss program. <laughs> Because you're just not going to eat very much. Uh, in Emerald Agassiz's translation of verse 13, it reads, You are the bam of the earth. Good description of salt. And then in verse 14, we follow that up. You are the light of the world. And he has just prior to this gone through all of these blessed states that we are in because of things that aren't pleasant to go through. How can we be salt, putting zing into life, into the world? How can we be that light that shines in the world when we're going through all this junk? junk that you have gone through yourselves. How can that happen? Well, we're going to kind of look at this maybe in a little bit different way this, this morning. You are the salt and the light of the world. Whoops. And the first thing I think Jesus is teaching us here is that we are the presence of Christ. In the world. Do you think of yourself that way? Being the presence of Christ. When you were going about your daily routines. Being a, a child of God. Which you became when you accepted Christ as your savior. What that means is that you are the presence of Jesus Christ in the world, in your world. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's restored. Restored to what God created us to be in that relationship with him. The ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us. And if you're using scripture, put a circle around that us. That is you. Has committed to you the message of reconciliation, of restoration. And then we get to verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. He is representatives as though God were making his appeal through us, through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In other words, that is your calling, to be God's salt and light in this world, as Jesus was that salt and light to the world. What is the first thing God created? 
Genesis 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4, God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. The first thing God created in the heavens and the earth was light. But God did not create darkness. It was already there. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness has no power or purpose except to obscure what already exists. Salt and light both have power and purpose. Our power, it comes from Jesus' spirit that's living within us. And our purpose is to do the good works, to do the good deeds that will cause others to experience the love of God. To be that light. So what does that look like? I ran into a a story by Pastor Joe Whittier. He tells of a friend of his, Bob Moffat, which doesn't mean anything to you, but that's his name, Bob. Bob had a neighbor who had a uh, substance abuse problem. His neighbor had made it clear to Bob that he didn't like Christians and didn't want anything to do with Christians. But when the neighbor neglected his yard, Bob quietly, and I'm not too sure about that word quietly because I don't know how you mow and weed eat yards quietly, but Bob took on the task of taking care of his neighbor's yard for two straight years. He performed this tedious task. After two years of watching Bob take care of this guy's yard, this neighbor of his walked over and asked Bob to tell him about this Jesus that he believed in. Years passed, and both Bob and his neighbor had moved to different neighborhoods. But one day, Bob's former neighbor ran into Bob and invited Bob and his wife over to his house for dinner. And he said during that that meal, Bob, because you cleaned my yard for two years, I came to believe in Jesus. I am now an elder in my church and I am free from alcohol. All the weekends when I am, on the weekends when I'm not working, I find people who have problems and needs like I had, and I try to help them. This all happened because you loved me with Christ's love. This all happened because you were salt and light in my world. Your good deeds has an impact. It's that candle that makes a difference in the dark. People can sense God's love even in the smallest acts. Oops. Even in the smallest acts of kindness. We are the presence of Christ. In this world. Probably better to put that. More personal. You are. The presence of Christ. In your world. Second thing that Jesus is teaching us here. Is. It requires a conscious choice. On our part. In verse 15. He refers to this light. Someone who has this. Lights a lamp. Would they hide it under a bowl? A bowl? No. What is the purpose of it? They wouldn't do that. It kind of defeats the purpose of light if you do that, doesn't it? Yet, aren't we guilty of that from time to time? Think about Jesus' words to his followers who have faced rejection persecution, and death for following him. 
to them he said, and this is the Dur translation, my translation, rejoice, jump for joy. Make the conscious effort to be salt and light for everyone. No matter what you face, decide that you will respond with love and good deeds. It's a choice that you have. It's not something that humanly, naturally happens. It's your choice. I ran into a good illustration for this about a teenage girl who tr took a truly a disappointing, shall we say, situation and turned it into an opportunity for good. There's a story about 18-year-old Avery Sanford. Her mother and father had divorced, and her father was paying child support. And on her 18th birthday, it was going to be his final support check coming to her. But for some reason, her dad was... Uh, Nice, I mean, upset, wasn't very nice about how he re responded. And what he did for that, fine, that child's final support payment was pretty spiteful and, and even cruel. He dumped 80,000 pennies on their front yard of the ex-wife. Now think about the mess that made. We were eating with Chris and Karina last night, and they were talking about their grandson dumping their two-gallon glass jar of coins in the floor, and what a mess that it, it made. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's a mess, and it takes time to pick that back up. Why this father would do that to his own daughter, it's just mind-boggling. Why? Why? However, Avery, this girl, decided that she would rise above her father's hurtful and even spiteful gesture by going ahead and picking that money up and donating it. And she donated the $800 in total to a, a domestic abuse shelter that was local there. It was called Safe Harbor. Local news outlets uh, spread the story of of Avery Sanford's generous gift. And soon, all uh, over the country, there was donations being sent in to this safe harbor in her honor. What did she do? All of a sudden, in a dark moment, she let Christ's light work in her to be his light, to be his salt into that community. Can you imagine the pain that she must have felt when her father acted in such a cruel and petty way towards her? But instead of stewing on her own hurt, she created it good, created good out of that cruelty. Her selfless, conscious choice inspired strangers all over the country to do the same. Being Christ's presence requires a conscious choice. And the final thing I'm going to bring out this morning in Jesus' teaching here is that when we make a conscious choice to be the presence of Christ, no matter what our circumstances may be, our light will spread further than we can possibly imagine. On February 2015, 15-year-old Becca Schofield of New Brunswick, Canada was diagnosed with cancer. She underwent uh, intense therapy, treatments, but in 2016, Becca's doctor told her that her cancer was going to be terminal. 
that she only had three to six months left to live. Becca had one wish on her bucket list. That wish was that the people in her community would perform acts of kindness for one another. And that they would record those acts of kindness on social media so Becca could experience their joy. Share their doing good deeds so that Becca could experience the joy of them sharing that light. She suggested that they post their good deeds to hashtag Becca told me to. Becca told me to. As Becca said in an interview, people have a natural need to do, don't miss that, a natural need to do good. And that is what I'm doing. I'm being that vessel to do good. Word spread through her small community at first, and then people performed a, performing acts of kindness for their neighbors, for strangers, and started recording them. As more and more people saw the, this hashtag, Becca's story spread. And soon people throughout Canada began doing acts, random acts of kindness in their communities and post them to the hashtag Becca told me to do. And from there, the movement went viral. It spread to the United States as far away as to Australia and to Japan. Ann Simmons was the mayor of Becca's hometown of Riverview, New Brunswick. And she said, it touched our town, it touched our province, and it touched the world. Becca's parents said reading the online posts about people's good deeds gave Becca strength and encouragement. She outlived her doctor's original prognosis. She passed away when she was 18 years old. Becca's father, Darwin Schofield, he posted to Facebook, after her death, and this was his post. You gave her hope that all the good and the bad of the past three years had a meaning. Even at times when that was hard to see, we pray Becca told me to, hashtag Becca told me to, will live on. Keep her dream alive. And our beloved Becca will live forever. And he ended with simply, be kind. There are so many illustrations of this, of God being salt and light to the world. So many illustrations from even in our small group of God being salt and light to the world through you. God loves, love for mankind is, is limitless. And he demonstrated that limit, limitless love for us by sending his son, Jesus. And showing the world what salt and light is. And how it makes a difference. And he's called us to carry that on. Be salt and light to the world through your good works. And let it bring glory to God, our Father. Like Becca, Jesus knew that we, he wouldn't be with his followers for a long time, physically. And so he's telling them here, basically, and he's telling us, keep my dream alive. I am the light of the world, and now it's your turn 
to be the light that continually shines out of the darkness of this world. Take my presence with you wherever you go. Make a conscious choice to do good no matter what your circumstances are. And if you do these things, my light will spread further than you could ever possibly imagine. Just close your eyes for a second and hear God say to you, you are salt and light of the world. Father, we thank you for this reminder. This isn't news to us. But Father, sometimes we get caught up in this world, the darkness of this world. And we sometimes struggle with being your light and salt to this world. I thank you that you knew we would struggle with this. You knew we would need help. So you made the way possible for your spirit, your Holy Spirit, to dwell within us. And to be that, that source of reminders of things we know that we've been taught that maybe that we're not putting into practice. Father, help us again, as we've prayed so many times, to stay aware of your presence in us and let you help us to be your representative to this world. Not worrying about having a worldwide impact, though it might, but just having an impact on one person Maybe somebody at Walmart we run into that needs help reaching that top shelf. Maybe it's somebody just going down the street that just needs to be, have, receive a smile. So many things, Father, in how we live our day-to-day -day life. So many ways we can be your salt and your light in this world. Help us to desire to be exactly that. In Jesus' name, amen. And turn in your hymnals to 664. So send I you. This is what God is telling us. You are the light, salt and light in the world. So I'm sending you. Please stand.